Hi, Dr. Suzanne Newcomb. So today you're going to be telling us about understandings of the body in contemporary yoga. Could you just tell us a little bit about the research that you've done in this area? Sure, thank you, Sarah. Um, one of the things that I've explored as part of the area project is how people are using concepts of immortality and life extension in the contemporary context to do with, with yoga and Ayurvedic practices. And um, Ayurveda has a very different understanding of the body than biomedical science, which is, is very much um, an anatomical understanding and, and you break it down into constituent parts and see um, causal mechanisms for uh, say a pathogen, um, which might cause an illness. And, the, the Ayurvedic body is actually not very well illustrated and we've we've looked for illustrations of it in terms of drawings but quite often you get a yoga body um, in drawings which is a bit different so, so Ayurvedic bodies are very much systems based they're understood as um, illness and disease is caused by imbalances of the different elements of the body so there's the doshas which are substances which circulate within the body there is datus which are substances um, sh which shape the physical body um, in their quality and their relationship with each other and there's also mala or waste um, elements which which need to leave the bo body and imbalances with how these systems are working um, can cause illness and disease and the the way people think about these systems is also about how are these imbalances perhaps setting up a pathway for disease even if there's not disease now but it would be, uh, be a big mistake to think that classical Ayurveda doesn't consider other forms of illness um, they also understand there's there's kind of environmental factors um, there's um, Ill, uh, injury due to warfare, um, due to accidents. Um, there's also um, a, a more historical vein that is also present in some contemporary Indian context of possession playing a role in causing ill health and, um, and disease, as well as kind of um, epidemics are, are also recognized as something that happens. And Ayurveda is, is a very dynamic set of principles that people apply in different contexts so although there's central texts um, of the Sharka, um, Charka Samhita and the Shustra Samhita which were um, codified in their present form in the early centuries of the common era um, the techniques upon which those texts are based are much older and although they're kind of touchstones that, that practitioners come back to in terms of referring to the principles and, and making sure this is seen as a coherent medical system, there are, there are and always have been a really um, large variety of local um, variations on the theme of, of, of how, do, if we understand the body in this way, what's the best way of ensuring health and um, preventing uh, and, and ensuring health really um, so in a lot of contemporary contexts and in yoga circles in particular this very complex um, rich tradition of Ayurveda often gets flattened into a tridosha theory of vata pitta and kapha um, so, so thinking about imbalances between air fire and earth elements and um, there's some similarities to medieval ideas about the humors and, and disease being caused by an imbalance of the humors. Um, but uh, it's a much richer and more complex framework for thinking about the body and health and illness than contemporary presentations often um, present at first glance. And would those understandings be the same in contemporary yoga practice or is that too much of a generalization? Yeah, I think it's it's really hard to generalize, but on the other hand, there's really huge family resemblances. Um, so, um, in a lot of, there's been a convergence of ideas about yoga and Ayurveda, and this has been um, systematically promoted by the Indian government. A lot of it's been since the 1980s um, into the 21st century. Um, particularly under the Modi government, and they're now closely aligned under the Ministry of Ayush and both systems. There are attempts to be more regulated, but regulation kind of flies in the face of the 
very um, dynamic and complex relationship these practices of yoga and Ayurveda have with religious religious meaning systems as well as health and healing practices. So they're, they're incredibly hard to regulate and there's a diversity of individual and group interpretations of, of these ideas. So someone engaged in contemporary yoga practice, what would kind of uh, their understanding be in terms of the goal of the practice? Are you seeking a specific cure or more general health? again it's really hard to make generalizations and i think researchers have um disagreed to some extent to which someone might change their positionality on this effect because some people go in to a yoga class say at their local gym or to deal with a specific um illness or, or complaints they want to be stronger they want to cough less they've got a respiratory complaint and breathing exercises might help um and then other people have an idea that maybe kind of one of the classic reasons people join religious movements if they're kind of looking for something more to life and they're not quite sure what and they they feel a bit embarrassed about joining a church but maybe there's something in this system that can give them um a sense of meaning and purpose however i think that for a lot of people um who who do take up the practice and stick with it there is something experiential which happens from doing the practice which is a bit separate than any beliefs in, in, in terms of a theology. So when people um, become more embodied, they, they do a set of practices that put their mind in their body in an active way. They often describe their mind being quieter. Um, they're, they're more able to respond in a calm way to their family and to the work situation. Um, they feel happier. And a lot of people kind of just continue because they like those effects and they want to maintain them and so that they, they keep to a level that maintains them and then some people become more interested and or and some people are particularly attracted to a, a more theologically oriented um tradition which does directly um hope to point you towards a, a route towards greater understanding of the nature of reality and hopefully less suffering for yourself and others in future and what about the issue of life extension and does that come up much is that an important issue for practitioners yeah that's a really interesting issue actually because on the one hand it's you could easily say that people are very uh, practical and, and scientific and most most contemporary people don't really believe that people could live forever on the other hand there's a lot of real hope that maybe there'll be technological advances and so there'll be some breakthroughs that will allow us to um, freeze ourselves and or download our minds somehow and it's tempting to see those people as crazy um but what i found in my research and talking to people is that people often are holding both positions at the same time so on the one hand they want to do a bit of stretching and exercise because they know that leads to um a healthier older age and we are living longer and so they just want to be as healthy and active as possible for as long as possible and that's a kind of um, clearly acceptable secular goal. But sometimes if you talk to the people, they'll kind of shift and say, but, but you know, we're, we're not, and another way of understanding it is about being um, identified with either a, a kind of a soul or a purusha or something that's not material that could be reincarnated or even um, uh, be identified with, with God. And so you're, you're going to merge with God. And there's a variety of individual interpretations, but people will often actually kind of hedge their bets in a way and kind of, well, but maybe, um, which is quite fascinating to see. And is the concept of community very important within these yoga groups that you've looked at? Yes, that's a really good question. And it does vary. Um, and I think that a lot of the, the, so some people definitely just attend a class in a gym. Um, and it's it's quite a functional um, fitness thing um but for other people it, it very much is about a sense of, of of people they regularly see and 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 build up a community around a teacher or around a class and of course some yoga and ayurvedic institutions are much more oriented in a kind of um guru shisha uh, format so you have a certain loyalty to the teacher there's a community 
perhaps around the teacher and there's an expectation of reciprocity in terms of time and energy and loyalty. But they're very much, um, uh, for most people, uh, communities of um, interest and choice um, rather than, than kind of communities of, of a historical family tradition um, in the contemporary yoga context. Ayurveda, in contrast, um, before the colonial period was often a, a family lineage thing. And so you would, you, and if it wasn't, you'd be apprenticed into, um, if you're seen as promising, you might be apprenticed into the household of someone who was a, an Ayurvedic um, badia. Um, so so the, there's that element as well. Um, community, I'm not sure if there's something else I want to say about community. Um, oh, it's been interesting seeing how um, yoga practices moved to Zoom um, in the COVID-19 situation and how people are connecting with groups that they might have been doing yoga with on, on WhatsApp and trying to maintain some kind of sense of community, maybe even becoming more aware of the importance of what might have been an implicit community um, before being um, isolated in our own homes. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see in different networks how how people's identity with their practice and with other people who practice that might um, might shift both during this period and as things return to normal over a period of time. Mm. And I wanted to ask if you um, noticed a tension between those individuals or groups who follow a particular lineage, which you mentioned previously, as opposed to those who adopt a more syncretistic approach? Yeah, there's always tension between the different groups. Um, and I think that um, in a way, the groups which have the most tension are often the ones who are most similar to each other. Like, so particularly if there's been two students of the same guru who have different interpretations, they'll probably feel most threatened by the fellow student rather than um, by a more distant group, which has a, a, a different interpretation. But broadly speaking, and, and particularly in, in Britain, there, there's definitely been a, a contrast between those who advocate um, following a guru, disciplining yourself and um, committing to a particular lineage of practice as a way of understanding yoga traditions. And there's a certain parallel with Ayurvedic medicine as well. Um, as, and then the other side of this is more perhaps from the 1970s Colin Campbell cultic milieu idea of you should take as many teachings from as wide a variety of teachers as possible and decide on your truth and your path. Um, so just uh, picking up on the point that you made there, um, is there any interactions or overlaps between the yoga and Ayurvedic groups that you've looked at and other movements that you would find in the cultic milieu? So like the human potential movement and new thought and those kind of ideas? Absolutely. The, there's a lot of new thought influence in both Indian and European understandings of yoga and these connections are being explored um, through historical research that Carl Bayer has been leading on um, as well as by Philip Dislip's work on um, William Walter Atkinson who was the, the new thought pioneer um, who published under the name of Yogi Ramacharika, which in his publications were very influential amongst um, British occultists um, and kind of the, the establishment of paganism in the early 20th century, like pre-Gardner kind of occult circles. But also they interestingly got picked up in India um, and got incorporated as an Indian author into Indian understandings of what um, yoga and and health and healing and how the mind affects the body um so it, it's very much been a collaborative production between um different esoteric elements and of course the theosophical society was also amazingly influential in our understandings of of mind and body and healing um in ways that we don't fully appreciate in in the west in that very problematic term but also in india because the indian members it, the theosophical society was huge in india and very active in the nationalist movement and the indian members were actively creating content and 
um, they're kind of written out of our understandings. But this was a, a, an amazing collaborative project in the modern period, the creation of, of yoga and, and um, alternative medical understandings of the body. And I think it's also important to, we, we think of the biomedical dominance, um, which has happened since the Second World War, and it's it's backed up by institutional power um, and and social um, networks of authority, both both in most European countries and in India. Um, but at the same time, we I think humans are always plural in their health choices, and they're always um, looking for something that might just make a little bit of difference. And so we're we're less um, consistent, and we're less. Um, logical in our healthcare choices and in our ideas about meaning and purpose to life than we like to present ourselves on paper. And I think that's a very good ending for our interview. So thank you very much, Dr. Newcomb. Thank you, Sarah.